there and welcome uh i am mary from mary's heirloom seeds and welcome to my weekly live chat uh, i try to go live here every thursday at 5 p.m central time uh i'm gonna see where we're at here awesome hey everybody uh if you are new to my weekly live chat welcome and for those of you joining me regularly welcome back i try to stay consistent at 5 p.m. Central on Thursdays. Sometimes we vary a little bit. I'm going to be also live this Saturday on Grow Big TV. Shout out to them. If you haven't already checked out their YouTube channel, check out Grow Big TV. And I'll share the link on my social media and YouTube uh, as soon as I have the link. But that'll be Saturday. Don't know exactly the time. I know I have it in my email, <laughs> but I'll get to that later. So tonight's chat is organic pest control and crop rotation or rotating your crops. Um, hey, hog legs. Thanks for joining me. There is so much information available uh, in the interwebs, uh, but I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit of that tonight. Now, I recently started a new Facebook group. Um, hey, Francesca, thanks for joining us. I recently started a new Facebook group called uh, mostly feral gardeners and it is a friends of Mary's heirloom seeds group where everybody can share their information um, Esther's daughter green thumb gardeners thanks for joining me and so I asked the question what do you want to know more about in my live chats so a lot of there were so many emails and some of the questions or responses I got hello southern pearl were issues that I'd already discussed, topics I'd already discussed. So in the description section of this video, you'll find a link to my comprehensive planting guide. You'll find a link to um, so, so, so much information. <laughs> hey, Thrifty uh, Endeavor, thanks for joining us. So every video I share this link because I have spent countless hours creating content, creating articles, videos, even uh, harvest recipes, and it's in my updated comprehensive planting guide. So some of the questions that people had, like um, cold stratification, um, organic pest control, seed starting, seed germination, that's already in my guide. And a lot of people didn't realize it. But there was an overwhelming amount of people that asked about uh, pest control but also about squash in particular christian says cheers mary any rain up there yes so if you notice i'm not in the garden today i'm undercover because it's actually raining right now um we didn't have the thunder and lightning storms that they said they would we would have but it is still raining and i didn't really want to sit out there and get wet because i can't see with my glasses when it's wet um so i'm undercover tonight um, and it is raining and my gardens are, I was just admiring the gardens. They are so beautiful and so greening up now that we just bypassed our um, estimated last frost date. So we are green light, ready to go, planting all the things right now. So organic pest control and crop rotation are my topic today because they almost go hand in hand. So before I get into all the meat and potatoes of it, I'll share with you the updates. Um, so shipping information is available at marysheirloomseeds.com. I am available via email at mary at marysheirloomseeds.com. Hey, Kathleen, thanks for joining me. Um, I have, I'm actually matching today. I usually don't match, <laughs> but I have my go, my cup and I have my brand new shirt. Um, one of my local customers, um, makes all of our shirts here. She's in Van, Texas, and it's amazing. So if you're looking for a Mary's Heirloom Seed shirt, I just got what I call the veggie basket printed on a shirt. Um, it's in the description section as well. But pretty much 90% of the questions that are asked are available, the answers are available in um, my updated planting guide, and that's in the description section there. We also added five gallon and 15 gallon grow bags to our website you can check those out and we're including a free pack of bush crop cucumbers right now if you purchase them during the month of march hey moon and blade thanks for joining me so 
without further ado, I'm going to discuss first organic pest control. Now, my first, um, Christian says I get used to you just wearing flannels. <laughs> I do wear a lot of flannels in the winter time. Yes. So my first line of defense against pests is companion planting. Companion planting is available on a small scale for a home gardener, moderate scale for a larger homesteader, or large scale for a big time farm operation. It is essentially planting crops that will deter pests, attract pests away from your main crop, or just generally planting crops that grow well together. And we like that. They have a symbiotic relationship, uh, some of these crops, where they can benefit them in some ways and uh, either with deterring pests, attracting pollinators, which is super important. You will never find me suggesting a uh, harmful pesticide, herbicide um, option for your garden. So if that's what you're looking for, tonight is not your night. <laughs> but I hope if you are currently using harmful herbicides and pesticides that you will listen to this video and you will find a workable solution for your garden that is not harmful to either yourself, your garden, or the beneficial insects in your garden. And that is my goal to help you grow a healthy garden with heirloom seeds. So companion planting is the full guide is listed in my comprehensive planting guide. Uh, now, also listed are some trap crops and I'll discuss that as well. There's also do-it-yourself um, recipes, I guess you could call them, that you can create your own pesticide um, that isn't as harmful to not only yourself, your soil, but also the beneficial insects that might be in your garden. And I will discuss that as well. So first and foremost is basil. Basil is often used as an ex insect repellent to deter thrips, flies, and mosquitoes. We love basil. I plant all the basils. <laughs> I have Basil planted in almost every bed. That is not my seed saving area because basil is delicious. It has medicinal properties and it's also fragrant. And if you let it go to seed, it can also produce flowers that are beneficial to the pollinators as well. But their strong scent can be a repellent for certain bugs. Marigold flowers has another strong scent that can deter uh, plant lice, mosquitoes, aphids, and possibly even rabbits. Not 100% sure on that because I have that fence garden and I don't necessarily have rabbits in that fence garden. Uh, borage is my number one for uh, tomato hornworms. So if you've ever seen those big old green worms that are munching down on your plants, um, I use uh, borage in every single one of them. Inga, thank you so much for the t-shirt um, compliment. My sister actually made this um, image for me and it was produced, this t-shirt is actually produced locally. So we're pretty like women owned, more power to you <laughs> kind of situation on the shirts. Um, dill can repel spider mites, also aphids. Uh, let's see what else. Um, it can, if you allow it to flower, it can also um, uh, attract beneficial pollinators or beneficial insects that will actually feed on the bad bugs, which is actually pretty cool, right? The only thing I will say about that is dill should be planted away from your tomatoes because they can attract tomato hornworms. Now I've seen along some of these Facebook groups and it's frustrating, but also I understand that everyone is in a different place as far as learning about gardening. I saw somewhere where somebody posted a picture like, how do I get rid of this bug that's eating my dill or eating my parsley? And my brain went, ma'am, that's a butterfly caterpillar. Eventually it will become a pollinator. We educate. So instead of bashing that person and saying, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Instead we educate. So that's what my videos are about. And I just wanted to hopefully instill that in people that are watching here that we always try to help people grow a beneficial garden, a healthy garden and educate. 
And that's the point of my videos. So dill is awesome. You will find butterfly caterpillars on your dill. Don't kill them. They're gonna eat your dill and it's okay. Sometimes planting for pollinators is a good thing. Um, but don't plant your dill next to your tomatoes because they can attract hornworms and you don't want those on your tomatoes, right? So plant them away from your garden. Uh, chives can uh, repel cabbage moths. Someone asked about cabbage moths, super important. That is something that is frustrating if you're trying to grow a healthy crop of cabbage and you've got a decimated crop. So um, chives are definitely important. They can also repel aphids. So chives are one of the free seed packs that I included with some of our orders during the month of, of March. So if you are interested in growing chives, check out my website, check out my comprehensive planting guide. It has information on growing chives. Sage can also repel cabbage moths. So I wanted to share that information with you as well. And it also wears wonders to keep cabbage, not cabbage, carrot flies away. So someone had said that they had some kind of like weird maggot looking thing, totally gross, right? Maybe. Um, and they're carrots. So that's a, a larva of a carrot, carrot fly. <laughs> so plant some sage around there. Remember that some of these crops are uh, potentially invasive. Catnip in particular can be invasive because it is part of the mint family. Uh, nasturtiums next on my list. Um, so if you are worried about some of these spreading um, catnip can reduce damage by, of flea beetles, which attack um, eggplants and brassicas and a couple other different varieties. So catnip can be planted in a container around your garden in those particular areas. And that's kind of where the grow bags come in handy. I mentioned grow bag. Last week was all about grow bags and containers. So you can plant in a grow bag, for example. Uh, catnip is a perennial and a mint family. So that thing's potentially gonna spread and continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. It's not an annual, so it's not gonna die off right away and not come back next year. So that's where planting in a container for catnip in particular is super helpful. Um, nasturtiums can deter bugs from your squash but they are also considered a trap crop. So Inga mentioned nasturtiums. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is nasturtiums are totally edible. The flower, the young seed, and the leaves are all edible. It is by far one of my favorite crops to plant. It is fairly difficult to grow from seed only because the seed shell is very hard. So I soak it in water for 24 to 36 hours before I plant it. I plant it in my garden beds, even though it can be a trap crop. It can attract aphids. I personally have not had an issue with it attracting aphids in my garden, but if you have an issue with it, you might wanna plant it away from your garden. So we're talking about tonight, organic pest control and, um, oh, thank you. Uh, we're talking about organic pest control and crop rotation. And the reason those go together is because sometimes if you continue to plant squash, for example, squash, by the way, I mentioned earlier, I started a group called Mostly Feral Gardeners. So if you're on Facebook, check it out. Squash was probably the most common concern with people. So I'm discussing companion plants for your squash, but I also want to talk about trap cropping and rotating your crops because trap cropping is essentially planting a crop that will attract the bugs and it is your sacrificial plant now i'll tell you this hubbard blue squash is one of my favorite trap crops but i have actually grown a trap crop of hubbard blue squash and still managed to harvest a squash a very large squash actually you'll see the picture on my website i'm holding it it looks like a a giant frozen turkey, people say. <laughs> it was 16 and a half pounds, and that was supposed to be my sacrificial crop. So trap cropping is also part of companion planting, which is also part of our organic pest control methods. Now, 
in my comprehensive planting guide, you'll also find links to do-it-yourself recipes. You have cayenne pepper flakes can be used to deter pests like uh, squirrels and rabbits. You have cinnamon that can be used to deter ants in your garden. You have neem oil and soapy water spray. There's actually a recipe. There's also instructions on not to use it during the day and not to use it in the heat of the day or uh, it's actually best to use in the evening time because you don't want to burn the heck out of your plants because it is an oil. So there's a specific recipe of neem oil and soapy water spray for munching insects like cabbage worms. Um, there's also a water, garlic, and cayenne recipe that can be brewed and strained. You can add soapy water or not add soapy water and you can use that as pest control. So all this information is already available in my comprehensive planting guide. All this information is free. So after the video, check out the description section of this video. It's already linked. It's literally linked in every one of my videos, at least uh, not the shorts, but the regular videos, you can find it. Um, and I've gathered all this information to help you grow a healthy garden. Um, so there are so many organic store-bought options that you can choose as well. But I will say this, before you start applying every store-bought organic option or some YouTuber shared this miracle cure powder that you can use, consider also healthy soil can grow healthy plants and a healthier plant is more available, more a stronger to fight off the pests and to fight off diseases because a sickly plant is more susceptible to pests and diseases. So rather than buying all that stuff to spray it, dump it, powder it, whatever you wanna do, look also to your soil. Um, and I have lots of videos about creating healthy soil, um, organic methods of building healthy soil that don't cost a lot of money or they're free inputs for your garden like compost, leaf mold, um, and those things can be readily available on your property if possible. Um, so these are some options for you that I wanted to share specifically about organic pest control. Um, plant diseases such as blight, say for example, for your tomatoes, um, that is a common thing. Uh, blight can be spread by wind, by human contact, by contaminated uh, tools, and also from bringing in outside plants that may have been contaminated that you're not really sure where it came from. Um, so blight in your tomatoes, for example, that was a question I received today. If you have blight in your tomatoes year after year after year, that means that there is a problem. Either your soil is contaminated, so you'll need to solarize. Your tools might be contaminated, so you will need to sterilize. Or you are using contaminated um, compost. Diseased plants should not be composted because if you compost your diseased plants, you are potentially spreading your diseases to the rest of your garden after it's composted. Potentially, I'm not saying it's a guarantee, I'm saying it's potentially. And we're trying to avoid uh, diseases and pests. So that is one thing that you can do is throw your uh, contaminated plants away or burn them. So it really depends on your situation. And if you're in the city, burning plants is probably very foreign to you. Um, and I lived in California where wildfires are a huge thing. It's a, it's a, it's a nightmare for most of us that have lived through fires in your area. So when I moved to very rural East Texas and my neighbors across the street have this big old bonfire in their front yard of trash, it freaked me out. But now that I've been here for three years, I realized that burning your trash, in particular, burning your brush is not scary. It's a common thing because you don't necessarily have um, someone that's going to haul away your, your garden waste. So burning is an option throwing it in the trash is another option. Um, but you should never compost diseased 
plants. Um, let me answer this question real quick. Uh, Jenny says, I do a great deal of container gardening. Can I reuse, reuse the soil each season? Absolutely, yes. Um, please check out my video from last week. I did a live chat on um, containers and grow bags. And what I mentioned was, as long as you didn't have uh, diseases in your soil, so if you don't have blight or something that is specifically a soil-borne disease, you want to um, refresh it. So you can use the same container as long as the soil is still nice and fluffy. Um, I use fluffy all the time. It's not a technical term. It's not a scientific term. I just use it. So if you don't like it, find a term that works better for you. But I say fluffy soil. It should be nice and easy for your roots to grow through. Now, if your soil is compacted in that container, I suggest dumping it out if you can. Fluff it up. Put, I know, loamy is the term. <laughs> Esther's daughter says loamy. I know it's loamy. Um, when I have compacted soil, I add uh, compost, I add coconut core, and I add perlite. And that is essentially my recipe to, um, to my container gardens. And you can also add a little nutrients. I use mountain flower root boost. You can also add um, worm casting. So check out KNC Worm Farm online. They've got, they're great. They definitely have um, some worm castings that might be helpful for you. Francesca says, born and raised in SoCal, fire season and fire culture is a very real thing. It is. It really is. And when you just see a small brush fire, you kind of have these flashbacks of like, you know, when I was in Ramona, uh, California, which is Southern California, I was watching the news and that fire was cresting over the Escondido Hill and we had Main Street and we had a couple blocks off was my house. And before that was a fire that they were evacuating two streets away from my house and they got it contained. So yes, fire is a very real thing. And if you're not comfortable with burning your rubbish, don't do it. I'm totally fine with that. It's just, I wanna share all of the options for you. Um, so Martha says, how do you sterilize your garden tools? So you want to make sure that you would sterilize it to remove any sort of diseases. Um, so here's the thing. Um, Esther's daughter says that's scary. It really is. It, it, and when, you, when I grew up in that, um, you have a healthy respect for fire. Uh, so I'm always super careful and it's raining here so I don't have to worry about that today and I'm really fortunate that we live in the area that we do um, because it is we get a lot more water and it's a lot less dry. So sterilizing your um, garden tools could just be as simple as scrubbing them with soapy water. It is. It depends on how you feel about different things that you use and different chemicals that you use. Some people it's bleach all the way um, or a diluted solution of bleach and water. And some people it's just soapy water. So I use Dr. Bronner's, which is an in, also considered an insecticidal soap. Um, it is a liquid, it is organic and I like it. So I will take a bucket of, um, I use a kitty litter bucket because we have a ton of extras. So I'll take a brand new kitty litter bucket, I'll wash it out obviously, and then I'll add um, Dr. Bronner's and water. And I will just scrub all of my garden tools. So if I use a trowel, if I use a hand shovel, if I use a big shovel, um, I will scrub all of my tools. Now, also keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to scrub everything. But if you're using something that you are, you know you are working with diseased plants, you know that you're working with diseased soil, definitely sterilize them. And it doesn't have to be like an autoclave. This isn't a hospital <laughs> situation, but you want to make sure they're clean. Um, so anytime that you might be dealing with that. Powdery mildew, for example, is a perfect example. If you are using gloves, if you're using bare hands, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to trim branches or leaves from a squash plant that has powdery mildew and then go right over next to another plant or another squash that's healthy because you are potentially contaminating another one. Um, can you use rubbing alcohol? Yes, you can. 
Um, that is definitely another option for um, sterilizing garden tools. Um, al rubbing alcohol is fine. Um, so all these things will help you cut down on your diseases and hopefully cut down on your need for organic pest control. This is going to be a little longer of a video. I wasn't expecting that, but um, you can talk. I can talk to you for days about all this stuff. <laughs> Christian says, does fungus from plants cause mysterious radishes? No. I will say this, though. There have been times where I where I have had customers tell me that they planted certain seeds, and they had so-so germination, and they harvested their stuff, and then the next year, other stuff popped up. Or you reused soil, and it pops up again. Um, so sometimes seeds won't necessarily germinate right away, but they'll germinate uh, the next time around. Sometimes it, all it takes is your soil drying out and then watering it again. And those seeds go, yay, hooray, here we come. Um, Christian, yes, sometimes I actually use um, regular like surgical gloves if I'm dealing with diseased plants. That way I don't have to sterilize my regular garden gloves because my regular garden gloves smell like poop right now. <laughs> I'll be honest, they smell gross. Um, but it's mostly because I deal with manure and compost and all the good stuff that smells stinky. Um, so I will use, uh, I won't use my garden gloves if I'm dealing with a potentially contaminated something I'll use surgical gloves and then that way I can throw them away. So, next on my list is crop rotation. Now, if you are planting <laughs> squash in the same place every year, you are literally creating a buffet for squash bugs and for squash vine borers. So for that reason alone, it is super important that you rotate your crops. Uh, there are so many ways of doing it. There are, it, it can be um, intricate. It can be simple and basic. And honestly, I prefer, I prefer basic. I don't want to have to spend, I don't need a, a what do they call it? March Madness where you have all your picks or whatever. I don't need that <laughs> for my crop rotation. So I'm gonna share with you the basics. I don't wanna overwhelm you with more information to where you go, okay, forget it, I'm thrown in the towel. So let's get started with crop rotation the easy way. In a home vegetable garden, uh, crop rotation is as simple as planting different crops each season or each year. Really simple. So why is crop rotation important? Um, each vegetable classification uh, has a particular disease or a particular pest that can affect the health of the plant. And by rotating your crops, you can potentially disrupt or stop that from happening or from happening again. So diseases and pests over time, Diseases, pests, pathogens um, will continue to take over that same area. And I mentioned blight earlier. Um, and by rotating your crops, specifically tomatoes that are affected by it, blossom and rot that uh, is commonly an issue with inconsistent watering, but it can be a calcium deficiency. Rotating your crops can help you with that. Um, it also helps manage soil fertility. So if you are constantly growing a heavy feeder in the same spot every year, you are either going to deplete the nutrients of your soil because you're planting something that is sucking the nutrients out, or you are not going to have healthy plants in that area because you aren't, or, or the third is you're going to have to continually to dump, dump, dump nutrients and fertilizer in that area in order to maintain a healthy plant. So what you could do is if you planted tomatoes, which is a nightshade, peppers or eggplant, which are also nightshades in that area, plant lettuce, plant beans, beans, the roots can put 
nitrogen back into your soil because it, it grabs it from outside. Um, Wickers Hill says, if I put out squash now, is there a lower chance of squash on boars getting them or is it late season better? I would say early season and late season is best for squash, but I will also give you some information on uh, squash vine borer resistant crops before the, the end of the video. Um, so like I said earlier, if you are planting the same thing in the same spot, you are giving the pest a consistent food source. So switch it up. Uh, if you always have aphids in that area, plant something that is less, less prone to aphids. If you have squash vine borers, if you plant squash in the same area and there are eggs in that soil, if you plant them next year, when those eggs hatch, boom, you have more squash or, or you have more squash vine borers or squash bugs. If you have squash bugs that are continually going to the same place to lay their eggs, if there are no squash for them to consume, you can potentially break the cycle. Awesome, right? I'm trying to make it easy for you. And hopefully this will help you grow a healthier garden. Now, I said this earlier, I created a group called uh, Mostly Feral Gardeners on Facebook. And if you're not on social media, it's totally fine. Hey, Agape Field, thanks for joining us. Um, I got your email, by the way, and I meant to respond and I completely forgot. So I'll email you tonight. Apologize for that. It's been a little hectic. Uh, this week. Um, so, um, I, like I said, I created this group and I asked people, what do you want to know about? And squash was a, a big part of that. So I wanted to share specifically squash information tonight, but also, um, all of the things pretty much. Uh, Inga says, um, can you still get a <laughs> squash that is squash bugs? Do they carry anything that can make them, uh, make you sick? Okay. So here's what I will tell you. If you have there are two, two major squash pests, three actually, but I'm going to talk about two. You have squash vine borers. Squash vine borers are this disgusting looking maggot that bores into the vine of your squash plant and they wiggle inside and you can see almost what's called what looks like sawdust coming out. Yay, thank you. Um, by the way, if you want one of these shirts, it's in the description section of this video. It's brand spanking new. We just released it um, last weekend, this weekend. So squash vine borers will bore into the vine and it will kill your plant. Now, it sometimes you can operate, <laughs> you can uh, have, perform surgery on your squash plants and it's literally, I take my fingernails and I pull that little maggot looking thing out and I squish it. And then what I have done is I have buried the base of the squash vine. Sometimes it lives, sometimes it doesn't. So I will give you that much. Now, squash bugs are different. Squash bugs have a life cycle and they are funky. Um, they are these beautiful orange and black looking bugs sometimes and they lay their eggs and you will see little brown, pretty looking eggs on the underside of your squash. And then they hatch and you have these little teeny, almost microscopic, but not really little teeny gray bugs. And they get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger. And then they kind of look like a stink bug before they look pretty again and start flying away. So, there are two major squash bugs that are discussed. Now, both of those have their, um, their goods and their bads. Um, I've seen people use BT. Um, it is an organic um, herb, not herbicide. It's an organic pesticide. You can spray your plants and it's absorbed into the plant. You can, I've seen people inject it into their vines of their plant. Um, it's not something I've done, but it is an option that some people have tried. Um, so if you have squash vine borers, it not, it's not necessarily a death sentence to your plant, but it, they don't always live. Um, um, so I already mentioned trap crops, so I'm not going to mention that as far as, um, crop rotation, um, vegetable crops in the same family, like I mentioned earlier, should not be planted season after season. So nightshade 
uh, is tomatoes, uh, eggplant, and peppers. So rotate your crops. Squash, plant something different in the same spot. Um, brassicas, plant something in a different spot. So the, the classifications are available on my website. If you're not really sure what's a brassica, you can always send me an email and I'll send you a nice long list. It's not just broccoli and radish. There's a couple other things that are in the brassica family. Um, so those are really helpful if you had specific pests that attacked one family or another. Generally, they follow along the same lines. Um, so organic pest control and crop rotation was my topic tonight because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, yes, you can uh, use store-bought stuff that might kill the plants, but also please keep in mind, I will say this before I finish off, some of the store-bought options can also harm beneficials. So in my book, it's easier to work with nature than continue to fight, fight, fight. Now, before I finish, I will share some of the more pest tolerant squash varieties that I personally have found and that have been successful in a lot of my customers' gardens. I cannot tell you how many people I have given this information to and I've gotten back, oh my gosh, Mary, I actually grew a successful squash thanks to this information. So first and foremost is if you wanna grow a fast, fast, fast maturing squash that maybe is still gonna get eaten by those bugs, but still possibly going to give you something before it gets eaten by those bugs. Uh, white scallop squash, Benning's green tint scallop squash, and lemon squash. Both of those are fast, fast, fast maturing um, summer squash varieties. And Inga just beat me to it. Tatume is the next one. It is a summer squash when harvested early, but you could also harvest it later as a winter squash. And the other one is tromboncino. It is an Italian, also called zucchetta zucchini. It is an Italian squash that is absolutely fantastic. Delicioso, as they say. And it is a vining squash. Um, all of these, uh, the tatume and the uh, tromboncino, both can be harvested in summer, both can be harvested in winter, both are resistant to some of these pests. Last but certainly not least is the seminal pumpkin. Hands down, my favorite pumpkin. It is, it is smooth, it is delicious tasting, it is a long storing uh, pumpkin, it has flavor, it can climb a tree, it can climb a fence, it can grow around the ground, and it is to more tolerant to pests, more tolerant to drought, and also more tolerant to um, a lot of water because it's from Florida. So it is a fantastic variety for it. All right, let me read some of these. Marigolds as companion plants have helped my squash production. Absolutely. I did mention marigolds in the beginning of the video. Meg says, can you trellis all squash or some better left on the ground? Now, I will say vining squash can be trellised. Most of the summer squash are not going to be a vining. They're going to be a, a bush squash. I have seen people use almost like a, a tomato cage and make them go up. And sometimes that's successful. I personally have not tried it, so I can't tell you that, yes, absolutely, it will work. But I will say that there's a vertical squash growing movement right now where people are growing winter squash or summer squash up to keep from pests. That's an option. And I'll tell you, I will be trying that. I've got some uh, trellises and some, uh, I'm looking at it right now, some of my do-it-yourself tomato cages that I will be using on some of my squash varieties. And I'll let you know how it comes out. So tonight's topic was um, uh, just a, an important one. I do have a video on crop rotation. I do have a video on companion planting and pest control, but I wanted to kind of bring it all together. Um, in the description section of this video, you'll find a link to my comprehensive planting guide, the five gallon and the 15 gallon grow bags that I discussed last week, these cool little shirts that we have made and the um, reusable cups that we have. But before I go, there's also a link to sign up for my email. 
as soon as I'm done with this video. And of course I need a snack because it's getting late in the day and it's been a very, very long day. Um, I will also be sending out an email and there will be a lot of great information about the couple videos that I've done before and a few specials. So I decided to do a radish discount code and it's called, what is it? Um, I think it's rad 25 or rad 24. You'll just have to see in the email that I'm going to send out this evening time. <laughs> so sign up for my email. And if you are signed up for my email and you're not seeing it, check your spam folder, check your other folder, whatever you've got, depending on what email you have. And if for some reason you don't see it, you can always send me an email. My email is mary at mary's heirloom seeds.com. And I do answer emails, but sometimes it gets downright hectic around here and it takes me a couple days to get back to you so please have patience with me i always appreciate it thank you everyone for joining me for a slightly longer video today but hopefully a very helpful video for you if you have additional questions send me an email it's mary at mary's heirloom seeds.com i'm mary signing off and happy planting everybody it is spring and i am excited <laughs>